Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us with our app talk with series. And today it is really my pleasure to be able to work with Deborah Katz, who's going to be talking about redefining the word gifted. And this, of course, is in the context of Ingo Swan, who many people sort of felt he might have been born with this and was gifted. And we're going to get the full story, I think, today a good part of it, and this is really about and for Ingo Swan and how it connects with you. Um, so Deborah is a longtime um, professional clairvoyant and remote viewer and author of, and you can see the books here, You Are Psychic, Extraordinary Psychic, and Freeing the Genie Within. Um, she's both a viewer um, and that's RV viewer and ARV viewer, and an instructor. She's one of the original app members and former webmaster, remote viewer researcher and research subject. She's director of the International School of Clairvoyance. She now serves on the board of the International Remote Viewing Association. She is also a member of the Parapsychology Association, the Society for Psycho Research, Psychic Research, and Society for Scientific Exploration and the Rhine Research Institute. She has a master's degree in social work and will soon have a PhD in psychology. She is a former federal probation officer and television host, and there's her website if you want to get more involved with her. Um, with that, Deborah, let's turn it over to you, redefining the word gifted. And what I'll do is I'll stop my share. And just as before now, you can take over. All righty. Okay, and if you can just tell me if you can see my yep. screen. Full screen, good picture of Ingo young version of Ingo. Well, I'd like to say hello to everyone here today. I didn't quite get to see the participant list yet, but I'm always so happy to join together in these talk widths, and I've learned so much from them. And today I'm really excited because not only are we going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects and historical figures, Ingo Swan, uh, but I've also brought along some special guests with me as well. And these guests have been helping me with research, with organizing my own archi archival research. They've been doing a lot of their own research and it's wonderful to be able to bring them together in this talk. There are also examples of people that are remote viewers who also do research. They do their own project. They participate in other people's projects. And one of the things I recently realized, I've been having a lot of people tell me lately that I have way too many ideas and projects and things that I want to do and it's just way too much. And I, I had an epiphany not too long ago that that is true. It is too much for me, but not if I bring together other people. And this is exactly what App is all about and how Marty has kept his vision of remote viewing activities going because he, when he founded App, he really had the idea that he was going to create groups that would be self, uh, self uh, independent from App, but also fall under its umbrella. And from that, so many people came together, including a lot of people that are together here now. And this is something also Ingo talks a lot about in his work that he says he really has to attribute a lot of his success to one circumstances being put in the right circumstances, sometimes by his own effort, sometimes perhaps by fate or luck, but where he came together with other people created opportunities Ooh. for him. He created opportunities for them and they were there's no one would even know who Ingo Swan was out or anything like that, or if it becomes unstable. All right, so just in case we have some new people here who don't really know who Ingo 
was, and, and this is a lot about, you know, whenever we are talking about somebody who is no longer with us, who could represent themselves in the flesh, all we have to go by are historical accounts from other people who either knew that person or studied that person's writings. And a lot of what we'll be doing today is studying his writings, and also some of what those who knew him had to say as well. But Ingo was a role model. He had excellent results within psi experiments, but not always. He was a real person and he wasn't perfect. And this is something we oftentimes don't hear about, whether it's about him or other psychics that make it to the big time where you, you read all about them, they're published uh, in uh, stories are written about them in the media. Um, we see them and we see their best examples. This is something that Joe McMonagall has talked about and actually complained about because he says, you know, people will just take a, a screenshot of the part of his session that was really great. And, uh, and they're not showing the times where he was off or he had analytic overlay or things like that. So then it's just so easy for us to form these ideas that will, the, those of us, those of you who are remote viewers, it's so easy to think, well, yeah, I'm, I can draw aspects of a photo or sometimes I'm totally spot on, but then I'm also wrong sometimes. And sometimes I'm very wrong or I'm describing the wrong thing. And so it's so easy to compare ourselves to these role models and think, well, gosh, I'll never be like this person was while you're not realizing that you are how this person was, but sometimes these people had special circumstances that they were put into, and this is exactly what Ingo said of himself. So he was a champion of what we do as remote viewers. He presents a roadmap. He thought more deeply of the internal mental processes and also the external society environmental aspects than just about anyone else at the time. So when he was really coming into his own as an intuitive uh, practitioner and really as a practitioner, all he really was was a, a research subject. I don't mean to say all in a demeaning sense, but just to say he, he never did, he was never the kind of psychic that does readings. Um, he, he didn't give people information about themselves, not formally at least. He, he just didn't want to have anything about to do with that, and he didn't know how to do that. And, and I'm speaking as someone where I am a professional clairvoyant psychic, have been so for close to 25 years, so in no way I'm demeaning that. But in, for him, he didn't know how to do that. And I'll explain, part of this presentation is explaining how he got to be where he was, because there's a lot of misconceptions about that. So, but at that time, he was very much studying parapsychology, and parapsychology was quite active. However, because of the context that parapsychology was set in, which, which was a larger psychological framework where it really was, at least in the research arena, it was not really uh, thought to be a valid task to be studying mental processes. It was much more about studying behaviors. So a lot of the researchers that he worked with or that were around at the time, not the ones that he actually got lucky with the ones he worked with. And I say lucky, but again, it was through his own choice because he wouldn't have stayed in research if he hadn't found the people that were willing to help him explore his own internal mental processes. However, he still was much more interested in that than those that were working with him in the lab. So he found people that were open to those things and intimately, uh, intimately paying attention to what he was going through. But even then, he paid attention to them and then he was able to articulate these to others, other researchers, and, and we'll talk about that, and then into what eventually came out as his own writings and his own uh, training programs. So his aim was not to be seen as a super psychic, it was to discover how this all worked and show the potential of the species. So one of the things that in just all my studies, and, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about my archival research in just a couple of minutes, but what I've discovered, and this is part of what I'm explaining just for those of you who are sitting here saying, okay, so Swan was a remote viewer, that's nice, so am I, so what's the big deal? Well, so what I found out about him over the 
the last few years was that he was a scientist. He was a consultant for research and development. He was a creative co-researcher co -researcher status. In some ways he got that, in a lot of other ways he did not get that. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, some of his own doing, some of the doing of the different people he worked with, and again, a lot up within the context that he was operating in in those days, and very much today too, if you're a subject in a study, meaning if researchers say, hey, I would like you to be in my remote viewing study, there's a very good chance, unless they're someone such as me, um, most everyone else is gonna have you go through the study. You're gonna do, um, you know, maybe it's just gonna be a one time, one trial remote viewing session, real easy. It could be a year long project, uh, session after session. And there's a good chance that your name may not get included in that study because generally it was thought that, that subjects should not, their identity should be protected, it should um, not have a bearing, the, the research is being done to show what people can do and not what the individual can do. Ingo was able to sidestep that and he, at least as in terms of being recognized as a subject, and he would be asked if he wanted his name included and he would say, you know, okay, sure. But there's a difference between having your name included as a subject and having your name included as a researcher. And this is one of the things that uh, has led to a lot of confusion about his role today. And also about the validity of his work and even how he's seen by other researchers. He's still within scientific communities seen oftentimes as just a talented subject. And then that gets passed down to us. So he would only do psychic work in conjunction with scientists. He worked with 12 research labs over the course of his life. In one year, he did 19,000 trials. And in a lifetime, he said over a million. And I do have documentation to show how Kudov, there's a letter showing, he's acknowledging that in one year, Ingo did do over 19,000 trials. They, they both agreed that was too much. And now keep in mind, this was not full fledged remote viewing sessions. You know, as many of you know, if you're, if you're just doing associative remote viewing, you might have a session that lasts two minutes to maybe 45 minutes. Um, if you're looking for a lost person, you could have sessions that go for hours. Well, he would oftentimes do very quick trials, just, uh, and some of these were forced choice. Um, we know there's uh, some kind of bleach in one canister and mercury in another. Um, tell us real quick which is which, and then let's go on to the next trial and the next. So there were days where he did hundreds of trials in a row. And now this was not unique to, to uh, many labs uh, across the country that were doing uh, at least four choice trials. So he um, also, he wrote his own reports of progress even when not asked. And as I'll talk about in the archives, it's very clear about that. He was constantly writing memos, reports, descriptions of his work, because he knew that a lot of what he was doing either would not make it into a final report, or at least what he experienced as he was going through trial after trial would not eventually get put into the report. Even today in many research papers, you could have just amazing examples of remote viewing, um, drawings, sketches that actually match the feedback photo. And I've seen now, having been involved in research myself for a number of years, that I'll, anytime I include these images in a paper that I submit to a journal, I'm pretty much told, no, we need to take all of this out. We don't have space for this. We need to go over your methods and your results, but we don't have space for these examples. So uh, this, he knew that this was par for the course, and so he kept track of things himself. And he knew that he, he speaks of his archives and that he knew he was gonna have these archives that were gonna eventually go off for others to see. He had this plan for years and years, so he really did keep everything. So he kept copious documentation of everything. 
Okay, so the sources for today's talk, and I have a lot of slides and we also have other speakers, so I'm gonna get through these as quickly as possible, but just hunker down, you might be here for a while. But these are just some of the sources that I referred to over uh, the week, because what I wanted to do was anything that I presented in this talk today, I wanted to try to cross-reference it with other materials and not just lie, uh, rely on that particular material. Because Ingo might have said something in one of his books or in his autobiography, and it does correlate with what he had in the archives, but sometimes he really, he, he could be very, uh, very uh, volatile, uh, stubborn, um, uh, emotional, you know, it was really pretty fun to see how, like, in the archives you have his letters to people, where he's just fired off a memo or, or a letter to somebody like Cal Pudoff or Jim Slayer or someone that he was comfortable with and working closely with. And then what, he, what you read about in his book, it correlates with that, but it's very much toned down to be much more polite. So, um, anyway, these are the different books, and I also did read um, two nights ago, from cover to cover, Captain of My Ship, Master of My Soul by Skip Atwater. And he he was also a talk with speaker, and if, uh, it was a great talk if you guys can um, find that if you haven't seen it. But I wanted to read his book because he was really the trainer for the military that when Ingo... Uh, when Ingo's training program ended and, and um, he went on to other things in SRI, which John Knowles will be talking about a little later, uh, but when, when he kind of stepped away from that training role, it was picked up, even before he stepped away, they were simultaneously really working together. So he was at SRI and Skip Atwater was within the unit at Fort Meade and the director of of um, training and operations there. And so I wanted to read his book just to make sure that everything really gelled together in my understanding and that helped a lot. So just stepping back a little bit, why am I even here talking to you today? I mean, you know, Marty gave you a little bit of my bio, but, um, but there's a lot of people that actually knew Ingo, so why should I be talking about him? And that's always a question I ask myself when I speak about anything. What, am I really the best person to talk about this? And I wouldn't say I'm the best person, but I have spent more time in Ingo's archives at the moment than anyone else has. Um, there's a few others. John Knowles has spent quite a bit of time there and is very good at going through re, uh, uh, information very quickly in an organized way. I'm I'm good at spending time somewhere, but not necessarily in an organized way. Um, but as you can see, some pictures here. I I was going to school at University of West Georgia, where Ingo's archives just happened to be, and so I spent two years, once a week, sometimes more than that, but at least once a week, I would go to the archives and study them, and I. I read through his correspondence, and then I was determined to read every single document in what's called the SRI files. And I pretty much, if, if I didn't read it, I took pictures of it, and I and took notes of it, and I still have reading to do. So, and a lot of refreshing to do from it, because now it's already been almost a year since I completed my work in the archives. So. Um, the archives are there for anybody, and I very much recommend if you feel like taking a trip somewhere, go to Carrollton, Georgia. It's about an hour out of Atlanta, and there are uh, there's just endless things to read. Um, in addition to Ingo's letters and memos, and there's reports from SRI. There's a lot of correspondence from other people, so this is not just Ingo's writing. It's those that were involved in the research efforts and um, and all sorts of interesting people um, in there. Uh, uh, he has a big art collection. He has files about his art work, um, boxes and boxes that I didn't even get to in those two years. And he also has a rare book collection. And he um, was, we'll hear from Cora a little later about him as an avid book reader. And so he had a book, a book collection of a thousand books, and these books are also in the collections. So this is a great thing to do with your time. And if you are going to, Glenn Olivier, who um, is has her picture up here, uh, she is head of special collections, and it, you just have to make 
uh, arrangements ahead of time before you go to make sure that she's going to be in town or she'll be able to help you. They've got some high security there. And so you just need to get things organized before you come. And so even if you know like a couple months in advance of when you'd like to go there, that would be helpful. And you guys can always get in touch with me if you need help getting in touch with her or have any questions about the collections. And these are just some, what I wanted to do today was to give you a feel for the archives and the different materials. So some of them are too small, I understand, for you to read on the screen, but this is the best I can do in a very short amount of time, just for you to eyeball what some of the documents look like. And to me, when, when doing any kind of historical work, you know, it's not just what the documents say, but how do they look? What, how are they, are there scribbles on them? Like I loved reading ink those, he had his original manuscripts where things were typed out. If, if nothing else, it's completely amazing to me that Ingo could have used a, a typewriter to type everything that he did. And he, he would type out his memos. There, there weren't a lot of handwritten things. So he must have been an excellent typist, but you could see he did a lot of crossing out. And it's fun to see the thing, because the, th the things that are crossed out are not completely crossed out. So these are notes and ideas that didn't make it into his final publications. And from here, you can see he was very much into um, astrology, uh, uh, precognition, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of subjects we don't necessarily know that he's involved in. Okay, so I wanted to know what Swan's um, gifts were. Were they developed, uh, or were were they natural gifts, or did he develop them? Because there really hasn't been a lot of talk, even in the remote viewing community, about there's always talk about how he helped others develop his gifts, but there's been controversy around this because there were some people that knew him at the time who said, oh, he just made up CRV. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't use any methods. He just made it up so he could get a contract and get paid. And, and he made statements to that effect to Stephen Schwartz, um, Ed May definitely has things to say about that. And so there, then that lessons, uh, that's been used as a reason to dismiss uh, some of his great contributions. And so what, what was up with that? What was going on with that? Well, we'll revisit that soon, but I wanted to really understand what was the true story here. And how did he, how did he arrive at his discoveries around CRV? It's been said that he, he reverse engineered what he was already naturally doing, but how was he already naturally doing that? Did he just, just wake up one day and suddenly be able to do a great job remote viewing? No, as, as we can see, that wasn't the case at all. And I wanted to know if CRV was seen to be effective and why the lack of remote viewing training and research. Well, remote viewing research in regards to training over the past 25 years. Why is there not very much research uh, or um, very much mentioned in the formal parapsychology literature that's come out in the last couple decades? So I wanted to, and I also, Going back to that, I wanted to know what role did Scientology play in Ingo's life because he was a Scientologist and there were other people at SRI who he worked with who were Scientologists. And, and we're gonna get to hear about that from Russell coming up here in a little while. So I'm really excited to hear about that. And there were quite a few documents uh, in, in the archives about his relationship with and, and role within Scientology. And I wanted to know that because even though there, there's obviously a lot of bad press about, about Scientology, as there are about other religions too, but I figured if Ingo and these other guys that are so smart and have made such great contributions um, had an interest in this, then there, there must have been something valuable with at least at that time that they were involved. So what was that? What was valuable? And that's what we're going to talk about more today. All right. So I still have about 100 more slides to go through. So uh, this is a little silly. But I, as I was thinking about the idea of um, gifts, 
versus natural gifts versus education. I suddenly in my mind had an image of of like a, a wild child that's been, we hear these stories and, and this does seem to be real that there have been kids over time that somehow um, were born, they were left out as infants to die and then they were raised by apes, uh, wolves. I did a little bit of research this week as I started to think about this. There's There were even some kids raised by goats supposedly. And so, and I was thinking, okay, well, what would it be like them where they're raised by animals, so no education beyond what the animals would teach them, but no human education. And so when these kids have been found, supposedly they couldn't speak, they couldn't walk upright, um, they can barely, they would burn themselves if they were given a bowl of soup because they didn't understand how to deal with the, the heat of the soup. So. They, and some of them were able to become educated and then um, at least uh, integrated into society to act like the rest of us, um, or uh, and some not so well. So I started to think about how this... Uh, wait, Deborah. Deborah, can you hear me? Somehow, wait, Deborah, you're breaking up. Deborah, you're breaking up pretty badly. Wait, Deborah, can is, you hear? Deborah, can you hear me? Deborah, and all we have is our subconscious. And wait, Deborah, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Um, you're breaking up, and I, maybe can you put that headphone? Can that happen quickly? That tends to be a bit better. Okay, I think it's my internet. I'm getting a notice that it's unstable. Ah. Uh, it should clear up. Is it does? Is it any better? It's gone on and off. Yeah, now you're better, but. Okay. Oh, that's actually better too. Okay, great. And just let me know, occasionally it'll get unstable and then we could just take a okay. pause for a minute until it, it comes back. Okay. Okay, so I'm not sure what, what was the last thing you heard me say? About the goats. Okay. <laughs> and hot water. Um, okay. Like, you so, don't really have a hundred more slides, do you? You just have a lot more. Well, well, don't worry. Well, okay. I, I don't have to get to all of them. Well, I, you know, I want to hear. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. We have, um, we have a fair amount of time. But go ahead. Keep going. Okay. What time would you like to be done today? Totally at, with questions by two o'clock. But if it okay. goes to two thirty or something like that, no problem. Okay. And okay, we're doing good. Yeah. So. So this was the concept that when we are, in terms of our own psychic abilities, we are basically like these, these kids raised by animals. We haven't had any better education growing up. And so the state of where we are, most of us, before we start to get some education would be equivalent to a, a lost kid being raised by animals, there's not, um, we, we would be acting, uh, this is an analogy for the, the lack of direction and help that we get in this area because all of society is just so, so behind on understanding any of this. And so we have a lot of catching up to do. And that was also, while this is my analogy and, and this picture is not from the archives, it's just a silly one that that I came across, although I think his face does look a little bit like Ingo. Um, this analogy has helped me to see how far and how much work we still all have to do as a society and also as individuals trying to uh, trying to educate ourselves. Okay, so within psychology, there is the nature nurture debate, and this has been going on since way before even psychology became a, a valid field with, within philosophy. And so the question of nature versus nurture also gets extended to our psychic potential. Unfortunately, the I, even discussion of our psycho, psychic potential is not being discussed in psychology. So today it's us talking about this. Is this what you're born with or is this what you're taught and how you're developed? Or is it a combination thereof? Um, and just a little quote here, Ingo said, 
This was from his, um, one of his autobiographies. I asked if the subject would have feedback immediately at the end of each session so that a learning curve, if any, could be noted. Yes, that was possible, although no one had thought about the possibility of a learning curve. So this was in 1972 or so, but even at that point, there, at least with the people he was working with, they hadn't really thought about that. So to us, the idea, oh, not getting feedback, I mean, we understand that there's valid reasons and sometimes feedback isn't possible, but even just the idea that that could make a difference. So you had people, again, doing hundreds of trials a day in, in research projects, and yet they would not get their feedback. And so they weren't able to, to learn um, in, in the way that Inga was able to, because he stepped in and made a suggestion. And you're gonna see that this is an ongoing theme here. I'm just gonna skip over some of these slides um, and just get right to um, some of the things that he had to say. But he, he speaks, and a lot of you have read his book, so I won't go into this too much, but why don't we know that uh, about gifts? about um, psychic gifts that are not just particular to an individual, but, but to, um, to all of people in society, just some get more uh, exhibited in people than others. So he talked a lot about fear of the psychic and subliminal influence. And these are real fears that people have. And again, I'm just gonna skip over some of this. Um, at the time, and I don't remember the exact year, but we have examples throughout history of where this societal fear, particularly in regards, not just to people being psychic, but just this, because it's one thing to think of people as a, someone as a gifted psychic. They were born with these special gifts, and it's not going to be too disruptive to all of society. But if you start taking these gifts and spreading them to everybody, then you have a problem on your hands. And so side development was marginalized and it still is today within parapsychology circles, if it's even within people's consciousness, which a lot of times it's not. Jeffrey Mishlove, who most of you are familiar with, and you, if you're not, you should, he has the, um, the uh, ongoing show, um, and now I'm going to forget the name of his show. Um, but it'll come to me in a minute. Um, so he has thousands of videos that, where he's interviewed different people. And so when he did his dissertation, it was on side development systems in the 70s. And he got done with his dissertation. And then, and then there was a movement to try to take it away from him um, because this was not supposed to be a valid subject of study. And he had to fight tooth and nail and his advisor, Charlie Tart, stepped in and then they went and got help from senators. And then he was able to um, keep his PhD in parapsychology. And he, he is the host of New Thinking Aloud. And um, so he has been um, a champion of, of um, all things psychic as well. But this was an example of how there were forces that wanted to really hide um, the, that there were people even looking into this. Um, Bob Morris, Bob um, did a lot of research um, at, within dream, dream ESP research and is very, very well respected. But I recently came across um, reference to a paper that he wrote called, where he referred to how-to books or, or uh, psychic development books as airport psychic books. And then the people that cited his research also referred to them as airport psychic books. And this was when I was doing research into different target types, what types of materials have been used for targets for people to psychically tune into. And even though they did still refer to these books, they kept referring it to that, which, you know, that is definitely uh, derogatory and marginalize, marginalizing. So, um, so these are things that really need unpacking, these words, development, training, guidance, monitoring, and this could be a whole other talk, so, um, but, uh, but this was very important to, to Ingo um, because I would say that even right now today, there are forces out there that are trying to downplay the, the teachings that Ingo and, and others that he trained um, 
that they're trying to continue to marginalize, ignore, um, downplay. And that isn't to say that there are uh, that these you know systems that Ingo or others have come up with that they don't need refining or that they're not going to work for everybody. But it's important to understand the whole societal context that we're dealing with. And any book that you read of Ingo's, uh, any even any of his writings, it was never just about what was happening in the moment with him. It was always what is this larger societal context. And when I first started to read Ingo's books and his writings in the archives, sometimes I found that a little annoying because I just wanted to get to the point of, you know, what, what do I need to know here as a remote viewer? And I felt like he was spending too much time on this societal stuff. But now I realize that that really colored everything from what he was able to do to what, what, how it was reported on. So here's just a couple examples of he he um had scrapbooks of newspaper articles and just hundreds and hundreds of newspaper clippings so it was really interesting in the archives to see what he had um, in there as far as what was being reported on and there was a lot of excitement about esp being used for espionage now let's get to his early years. So this, uh, if, if I was gonna, even though I know a lot of people are, are interested in his archives, I think to me, maybe because I spent so much time in the archives, but they didn't quite answer for me, how did he get started before he went to Stanford Research Institute, before he became affiliated with Russell Targ and Harold Pudoff, what was he doing? And so if we didn't get to anything else today, this is really what I want to hone into because it speaks to how did he develop. And so in the early years, and we're not going to go into his whole biography, but there, whenever he would be interviewed, he would tell about three experiences he had. And these were related to out-of-body experiences, spontaneous ones. One was when he got his tonsil, tonsils out and he was able to see um, what was happening in the in the operating room. And when he woke up, he asked to have his tonsils. He wanted them. And the doctor said, oh, well, we don't have them. And he said, well, yes, you do. I know where you put them. And he pointed to where they were. And everyone was, you know, quite surprised and somewhat horrified of what he was asking. And they did not give them to him. And he was very angry about this. So he had a tonsil incident. And then he had an incident that really he says caused him to shut down. And this was when he saw the death of a, of a, a friend. I, I think it was around the time when he was 11 years old or so. And he had an out-of-body experience then. And then he just said that he shut down. And he, he really was not um, even um, exhibiting too many psychic abilities up until he had, he went into the military, he was in Korea, and he had a transcendental uh, experience when he was sitting on a mountaintop. He had an out-of-body experience and it opened him up. And at that point after that, he realized that that was when he wanted to explore these parts of himself. The important thing here for our project today is that he didn't know how to do that. He did not, he didn't have this experience and then suddenly find himself psychic. He just had this experience that put him in touch with his deeper self to know that he, he wanted more than anything else to explore this. Um, after the military, he went and worked for the United Nations for 10 years. When he retired, that was really when he decided to devote his, his time or slightly before he was retired. So for about three years, he started to look into and, and start to practice with his abilities. Now, I have not found what he did in that time as he was practicing. That probably is somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. So he, he just worked on his own for a few years. And, and I suspect a lot of that was reading, um, reading whatever he could find. Um, was there anything else in that we're not quite sure? But what we do know is, um, and here um, through his own words, you will have to take my word that I had never considered becoming a psychic myself and never expected that I would or even could. I certainly had never even dreamed that I could be an experimental subject in a parapsychology lab or be invited to become one. 
Indeed, I had reasons not to do anything of the kind. Reasons I'll review at the end of this chapter. So this is from his unpublished autobiography, which is online in, in his bio mine um, collection of um, papers that are online. You could look those up under BioMind. Ingo's BioMind um, old website collection. You'll find it in a few different places, but I'm gonna be quoting from that because he does address um, some of his early history in this time. So he really um, was not, he, he says, I had reasons not to do anything of the kind. Um, okay, so then he goes into, and just a, a little bit, one of what he really, things of the, what he stresses is the environment he was living in in the time. He was an artist in Manhattan, and he had some friends that were socialites. Um, uh, several women and some with their husbands, but they would have lots of parties and gatherings where there were lots of psychics around. And he didn't think of himself as one of them, but he was definitely um, researching these subjects, reading about them, and, um, and meeting all sorts of people. And these were, the, this social group was very influential, so they had a lot of connections to research labs. There were parapsychologists there, there were actual um, psychics, uh, professional psychics there. And um, there were people that uh, were influential in different forms of government, including um, people that had ties to the CIA. But at this time, he was around 37 where he started to get into this community. And so um, one of the thing, two things happened. For, first, one, one of the things that was a catalyst is it, while he was over at some friends' houses, um, Zelda Zupri, who we read a lot about in the archival material um, in the earlier years, she was a really great friend of his. And she was having people come over with, um, with, photo with uh, cameras and they went into a bedroom and they were just playing around, but they wanted to see if people could visualize energy moving around themselves and then they would take a picture of it and would it show up in the picture and Ingo got pulled into the room. He explains he was not really into this, but it sounded fun and they told him to visualize energy. So he visualized it over his head. And sure enough, when they, when they got the, the uh, film developed, they saw a halo over his head where he had been visualizing the energy. And at that point they said to him, Ingo, you are psychic. And he was like, you guys are so silly. What are you talking about? And they said, no, this is a big deal. So they introduced him at a party to Cleve Baxter, um, who some of you will uh, remember. He wrote the book, The Secret Life of Plants. And he was doing research that uh, he was basically had developed technology for lie detector tests. And uh, to put it very simplistically, because I don't really understand it myself that much more than this, but he hooked the plants up to similar devices to these lie detector tests. And then he would walk into the room and do something and notice their reaction. So for example, if you walked into the room and had a big knife and threatened to kill the plant, cut it, the plant would register uh, a reading on his device showing that it had some cognizance or um, some some knowledge to what was happening with with that threat. And so Baxter was already researching this. He was very controversial. Um, he invited Ingo to his lab and Ingo um, came in and had some uh, some good effects with it right away. So they started to work together for a little while. And so this was um, really where the first times, one of the first times where Ingo was starting to exhibit signs that he could have an impact on something outside himself, which at the time it was called psychokinesis and still is. Although Ingo um, had some ideas about that, that as he was working with Baxter, he was discovering, or he at least it was his theory, that it wasn't that he was exerting his control over the, the plants or other things that he started to play around with. He, they also worked with graphite. And um, so he says here, um, I, um, let's see. These I described consisted of an awareness of indicating, uh, or an awareness of interacting with the graphite, not impacting upon it. 
the very great difference between interacting and impacting will become more clear ahead. And um, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about this a little later, but basically any time, if you look at his experiments with Baxter, if you look at, um, he would go on to work with Gertrude Smidler where he impacted uh, uh, thermometers, getting, uh, being able to raise the heat. Um, as many of you know, once he started to work with Hal Pudoff and Russell Target at SRI, he uh, was able to influence the, the quark detector. Um, there were other incidents where he ha was very successful with this, which is one of the things that propelled him into fame. Every single time, this was not a matter of where he sat there and, and exerted himself with mental, you know, just trying to squeeze out of his brain and in impact on these objects. No, each time he did what all of you already know, or most of you, unless you're brand new here, know how to do, which is he just got curious about what these devices were all about and essentially said, I'm going to remote view them. I'm going to tune into them and I'm going to tune in because I genuinely want to understand how do they work. And then as he understood how they worked, he, he, as he was getting impressions, he started to sketch. And it was at the point where he was sketching where he seemed to have an impact. Now, there were some moments right then, like he talks about with his work with uh, influencing graphite, where he might then, once he was really dialed into it through more of what we would think of as remote viewing and sketching, then he might direct something to it, like the idea of hot or cold, or he might see like his um, focal point getting uh, much narrower. So he did do, he did play around with some things he was doing in his mind at some points, um, but first he would dial into it. And that's something that all of you know how to do. The, and again, um, I, I wanna drive this point home um, because Ingo, he repeatedly talks about circumstances. The circumstances he was put in, the opportunities he was put in. How many of you here have had the opportunity to actually work in a lab with people interested in what you're doing and who are giving you all sorts of different tasks to do? Um, most have not done that. Even myself, I've, I've now been a subject in many different experiments. However, it wasn't like people were sitting there as I was doing my work on the edge of their chair, um, asking what I was experiencing and saying, okay, well, let's make this adjustment or let's make that adjustment. No, most of us have not had these opportunities. And so it's very possible that anybody listening here would have been able to do very similar things as him or maybe even much larger things as him. But we, but you don't know that because you haven't been, haven't had the opportunity to do that. And that's also what separates him from the rest of us, I would say. Okay, so now another thing that is important, this important part of Ingo's life was his work at the American Society for Psychical Research. So again, let's just backtrack a little bit. He went from just having some spontaneous experiences to doing a lot of reading in the subject. And then he did some um, uh, work with Cleve Baxter. And then he was invited to start doing some experiments with the Society for Psychical Research. And this was the American Society. So there's one in the UK that's very separate and is still, and they're both in existence today, by the way. Um, the one in the UK seems to be more um, active from what I can tell. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of controversy around the American one that Ingo um, talks about. But he was, he was invited to participate. And so there were some central figures here. You'll see up at the top, this picture is Janet Mitchell. And she had spoken at um, um, some conferences. She was at the International Remote Viewing Association conference. And um, Marty, I can't remember if she did. Did she speak at a at conference? I can't uh, remember. Yes, in fact, she spoke it too. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she is still around today. And so she wrote a few different books and she was, she was employed uh, as the assistant of Dr. Carl Oasis. And, I, I, and Marty, you might know how to pronounce his name. Um, I probably am slaughtering it. 
Um, he was from Europe and Ingo liked to mimic his accent. Um, so she, we'll just call him Carl, um, but spelled O-S-I-S. -S. And so she was his assistant for 15 years and she was really the person that worked with Ingo the most. And then this is also Gertrude Smeidler who um, was president of the ASPR and uh, she's the one that came up with the sheep goat theory and was very well respected and, and was very close to Ingo and really served as a mentor. He would not have gone on to do what he did, I am quite certain, if it wasn't for um, these three figures and especially um, Janet here and, and Gertrude's her influence as well. So he started to work there and after uh, a little, first he was volunteering and then they agreed to pay him $50. And I just wanna talk a little bit, um, this is where, again, this is where the evidence is that Ingo had a learning curve. It, they were impressed with what he was doing right away. And so they were impressed enough to want to pay him. So he did exhibit um, very strong abilities, but he uh, was not always successful. So, um, so this is writing from, let's see. Okay, this is Ingo's writing. So, and this is from his unpublished autobiography. So the first sessions of the experiment would permit a lot of trial runs so that the subject could get used to the affair and which would also permit Janet to accumulate, accumulate a lot of baseline data. OSIS also helped that I would hope that I would participate in a number of other kinds of experiments. Okay, so um, Ingo had a decline effect initially, and they did a lot of different experiments. And the interesting thing there was they would do a lot of trial runs first, um, as, as they saw that they had to constantly be making adjustments to see what would work or not. Um, and he says here, at some point, I got to wondering why all of this had gotten harder than easier. Um, so uh, he says, so after a failed session, I decided to have another look at the experimental setup to see if I had missed something. At first, I could see nothing amiss or wrong. So during the next session, I examined my own behavior while attempting to float up and see. So he's describing an experiment where they would have a shelf up above a bed. The shelf would be between 10 feet and 13 up above the bed. He would be hooked up to a lot of electronics monitoring his brain waves and skin response and heart rate. So he couldn't move. If he moved his body, they would know that he did. And this was an attempt to, to be testing if people could have um, vision and knowledge uh, if they intended to go out of their body. So I, I think this is a really cool experiment where, and he did, again, thousands of trials of this where he laid on the bed, he's hooked up to equipment, the shelf is up above, and on the shelf are a variety of objects. Now, initially, they were two-dimensional objects. So they were pieces of paper. There might be like a piece of paper with some different colored stripes or different pictures. And so he would be tasked with having to go up above his body and speak in the microphone and start talking about what he was seeing. And what he is describing here is that uh, at first he had success and everyone was excited and then things, he had a decline effect. Things were not going so well. And then he realized that part of the problem was that he was having to speak everything. And when he spoke, there were a lot of things that they were putting on the shelf that when he saw them with his eyes open, he could not tell you what they were. He could not even verbally describe looking at these things with his eyes open what they were. So why on earth then would he be able to describe them when he was looking at them psychically? He didn't even know what they were. Now, for those of you who are experienced remote viewers here, this probably is sounding pretty familiar because you've all had targets like that. And what you already know is that that's okay because this is why sketching is so important, that even if, you, even if your verbal description is off, and oftentimes it's off because either you can't make sense of it or it reminded you of something else and then you describe that something else 
but you already know that your sketches are often what match is the picture if that's the task. So what Ingo is describing here is the moment that he had that realization that he should be sketching. Now Ingo was not the first person ever in the history of parapsychology or psychic work to sketch. We know that from René Warcalier, a French parapsychologist. We know from Upton Sinclair and some earlier people, experimenters, that they did um, a tel telepathic experimentation, clairvoyant experimentation with, with picture drawings. But within this realm in the 1970s and within this lab, it was, they weren't sketching, they were speaking into a recorder and then someone else was transcribing, paying attention to what they were saying. So this was one of Ingo's many aha moments that then get, got transferred into what we're doing here today. Alrighty, so next, um, Mitchell, uh, um, let me just see if there's anything new here. She writes, there were multiple areas of confusion for Ingo at this time. Sometimes his vision would be white, sometimes black. He told me once that for nine days, he kept getting back into his body upside down. In this condition, his vision would be upside down. Then everything would collapse, turn back, and turn to normal vision. And so these were just notes that she took that are in her first chapter of her um, book where she's really outlining, and this is her book on out-of-body experiences. You can still find um, copies of this on Amazon. And it goes into other topics, so I'd say it's really just her first chapter that she very much outlines their work together. And then he and other sources uh, correlates what she has found as well. So she said that um, she outlined stages of Ingo's development when he was going through these different tasks within each experiment. Um, he would say, hey, how about that? I can do it. He's um, stimulated and happy. Um, if done at night, he was unable to sleep. So his first response was, hey, this is great. I can do this. And then he would go into, well, I did it again. Um, he was pressed, but not too excited anymore. And some of the reason why he was not so impressed is because he wasn't getting everything. In terms of this experiment on the shelf, he said many times, like, they might put four objects, and he would describe one object really well and not get the other objects. And just like those of you here who are really trying to hone your abilities, it, you, it's so easy to go into perseverating on why didn't I get those three other objects instead of why did I nail the one object really well. So why the hell can't I do this every time? He would be aggravated and frustrated because there were times he was totally off, he did not get anything. And again, she said if done at night, he'd be unable to sleep, he'd have an inability to sleep because of the failure, and that could influence the trials moving forward. So again, we're seeing that he was developing like us. Now, this is one of the things that I tried to do was look for his aha moments and, and the things that carry forward for the rest of us. And not that we all learn from him here, but we learn in similar ways to him. So some of you have seen this. He has this page. I think I got this out of his natural ESP book. But this has been discussed in other sources as well. So again, this was um, items himself, and you can see the middle picture here. So he um, did his session, and he was doing his session. He saw something that he Hold on, your, 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 thought they were in Arabic. Arabic letters, yeah, letters, a green thing. He was um, actually the other people there. Yes. Okay. Um, are we? Is my okay. internet going out? You're like back. It's kind of sad, but okay. I think I don't know what, what to do if it's at your end. Go ahead. Okay. Keep talking. Now you're fine again. So it's very strange. Okay. okay. Go ahead. All right. I, I live in a rural area, and this is kind of par for the course. So I apologize mm. for that. Usually it clears up. Can, can you? Yeah, now that? it's clear again. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So again, so Ingo was doing this session and um, he basically got a green thing and he wrote letters, maybe Arabic letters. Um, as soon as he was done, the researcher, no one thought he had done like that great on it until they really took a look at this. And um, I wish I had put the picture right side up here, but if you stand on your head and look at it, this actually, the letters read seven up and they're on a rectangular, uh, rectangular square and you can't see the colors here, but um, it's green. So he actually did draw the, the letter, the, the uh, two letters, a number um, in the right order, uh, the square, the green, but he did it upside down. Did he do it upside down because he was out of his body or his brain, his subconscious somehow translated this to him? Uh, but this was, and again, this is not that far off from what we see from remote viewers. In fact, because I was the webmaster for um, app for a while, um, I posted a lot of different um, different transcripts from remote viewers. Uh, there's one on there that I still love. It was one of Shane Ivey's um, of a lamp where he took different pictures and the, the pieces got rearranged. Um, so he had a, an ex a perfect rendition of this close-up of a lamp, but he just had the shape scrambled up. So was this an, uh, an issue of the brain kind of taking pieces and rearranging or was he literally upside down? This moment, while well, to me this is pretty cool, uh, it was fun again reading Ingo's own words where he said he had to leave the lab. He went to the, he got on the subway, he stopped in the middle of the subway station on the stairs, people walking all around him and he was literally in a daze. He, he was having not just an aha moment but where all his previous beliefs were coming together you know, he, he talks about the concept of reality boxes, and he has a book called Reality Boxes, where we have these ideas that form an, an overall um, picture, but he puts it into the, the term of box because then we get stuck in the boxes. So this was one of his moments that, where it was all shattered because his conscious mind did not register this. His conscious mind had nothing to do with this. So if, and he had identified with his conscious mind up to that point. So if it wasn't that, then what the heck was going on? There was a part of him that had a wisdom that could come through and give him what he needed. And again, this is very important, not just for him, but for all of us. And when we can let that part of our mind, that part of ourselves come through without trying to stifle it because it doesn't make sense with the part that we do identify, that's when magic really happens within our own remote viewing sessions. Okay, so again, we're still dispelling the myth of the perfect psychic. Um, and here he had to come to terms with that as well. Um, he says, I must caution that my picture drawings were not completely exact regarding all of the elements of the target trace. However, enough of the major elements were exact enough to permit the matching. I enter these comments here because of the myth that ESP perceptions can be as perfect as eye vision. I will discuss much more regarding this myth, but for, for it was to become a vital component of tutoring regarding controlled remote viewing. So this is really, again, why we're here today. It's not to say, you know, forget about trying to be perfect or forget about trying to improve yourself. It's just about, we sometimes have correct information, we sometimes have incorrect, we can work at it, but it's completely futile to, to, to beat ourselves up, comparing ourselves to a myth that, that really doesn't exist. And if we can get rid of that, then like Ingo did, we can get to the really the gritty of what's working here to, to improve, which is really what his whole system of training is about. Um, I'm going to skip over some of like that, again, about SVL, um trial, and then somebody um, he was working with 
said, um, does this mean that you can read our minds too? Um, and here I had inadvertently tripped across the most feared of the hidden wires in parapsychology research, mind, mind probing. So people were afraid if he could do this good a job with even just describing pictures, then could he describe people's minds and their secrets? And this is what he believes is one of the reasons why society does not want to acknowledge that this is an inherent ability in most people. Okay, so Mitchell said there's a learning process in Swan's identifying the platform targets. Uh, many days were spent helping him to learn to improve his vision. Um, he had trouble with color discriminations between white and yellow and blue and green. So some colors he could discriminate. Um, he, he was able to tell purple stripes on a black background. And yet, if he was asked to discriminate between white and yellow, he was having a hard time. Now, he would go to doing thousands and thousands of trials uh, having to do with color and identifying color once he got into the Stanford Research Institute. So he took a lot of these early studies and he brought them with him. Okay, I'm just gonna amp things up a lot and bring us forward. Um, so what, what have we learned? Um, I think I've already um, said enough about the learning curve. Um, so word got out, going back to the history, word got out of his success um, at, at um, the ASPR. And he, um, at first he had a hardcore policy that he would not talk to the press because the press had really um, so much um, um, stymied the reputations of other psychics, marginalized them, slandered them. So he was not going to talk to them. However, uh, he finally got convinced that he should do that and that would be a useful thing. And so he was featured in Time, Time Magazine. Um, he says, I was a genius, an experimental innovator, an inspired mystic and can travel out of body anywhere I wanted to go. The ap appellations of super psychic and superman now surfaced for the first time. So people were saying he had x-ray vision, he was a superman psychic. Now he did run with this and, and talk about the superpowers or super bio, bio powers. Um, a lot of his books use terms that we may not be familiar with. He uses terms like bio powers, um, by the bio mind. And as he um, goes on to explain in a variety of sources, these were actually translations of what the Russians were um, of their terminology. So he, um, there's also been a lot out there that the US military programs came about because the Russians um, were found to be using psychics and not just using them in a small way. Um, they found out that $20 million um, had been devoted in the Soviet Union to psychic research. And there were several different labs, not just one lab. And so this was the environment where our US government was becoming aware of the Soviets' efforts. Ingo believes that the Soviets had a whole different um, terminology. They had a different way of looking at these things. And they did see psychic abilities as inherent within the species, within within humans. They did not have this approach of the individual, um, either a few being gifted and that was it. And he feels that that's what they were, um, they started off with that mindset. And so that led their research in a different direction. And so some of the terminology that he would use would reflect that because again, in America, the, in, in American science, the whole idea was, it's about what your brain, it's all about the brain, nothing else exists. But the Soviets understood that this was a full body operation, that all of your body is engaged when you're using your psychic abilities and your psychic abilities can come out like just like in sketching um, or in what direction your body moves when it's, uh, when it's subconsciously inclined to avoid an accident or move towards an opportunity that, or that your body can sense um, things before they happen. Now, parapsychologists in the U.S. 
became aware of that our bodies register on a physical level as, as well. These are called presentiment experiments that your body can actually register in your heart rate or a change in your brain waves right before um, your um, all the, um, so his um, his focus was more on what what are the Soviets learning and you know what do what have they had to say about this he wasn't personally concerned about the threat like our government was he wanted to learn what did the Soviets know so he could um, build on that himself all right so um, he was invited to Stanford to SRI and I'm just going to talk for um, 10 more minutes and then we're going to have John um, join in with us here. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do since there's so much to cover with Stanford Research Institute is just really cover uh, a few highlights. So he got um, invited to um, by Hal Pudoff. They at this point when Ingo got involved they were just getting their funding together. They didn't um, Hal might have had some initial money but there wasn't really a whole lot. And the point I want to make here is that Ingo helped to develop the the program there. It wasn't that he was only um, he was only there as a research subject. There are documents that show that he had meetings with Hal to go over what they might cover in their initial research. And I'm just going to skip over um, again. Um, Ingo had. Uh, some scrapbooks with some really interesting, um, fun um, things in them. Um, this was one of them. Uh, this was uh, the New Times that interviewed him. And it says, Mr. President, the Russians have just psychokinetically disarmed our warheads. And then the other guy, the president says, this is a job for super psychic. So this was really the mindset as news were, was coming out that um, the military was working with the Stanford Research Institute to test psychics in order to understand what could the, the Soviets or other countries do against us. Um, so um, I, I'll not bore you with the little details here, but again, there were documents showing um, important proposal for research found in SRI papers box one. Um, so this was a document showing um, what was um, um, what started to form their whole program. And there's a lot of information in the archives about this. Now, um, this is something that, um, again, there was discussion. Are gifts um, just something that someone has or are they developed? And you can see right here, um, Ken Kreese, he was um, an early funder or one of their clients, um, representative of one of the government agencies. I believe it, he was representing the CIA. Don't quote me on that. One problem within um, studying the archival material and really any books on remote viewing is because these programs were classified, oftentimes they referred to different players as the client. And so sometimes it's hard to piece together who was who and what programs did they, they come from. Um, but Ken Kreese is, is mentioned a lot in the early archival SRI materials. And, he, and it was written, um, so this was to, from Hal Pudoff to Ken um, as he was proposing the program, uh, trying to get funding. Of special interest is the fact that Mr. Swan's abilities apparently were not innate but rather developed by a set of training procedures. Therefore, during the course of the study, information as to possible training procedures for the development of such abilities will be compiled. And um, here is just, let me just see if I can, I'm not able to see the bottom of my slides because of my um, computer here, but, um, I, I just found this yesterday, um, a picture I had taken from his scrapbook. And he says, I'm satisfied in my own mind, this is a human potential, not an individual potential. So even in 1973, he had come to that conclusion, just skipping around here a little bit. Um, so he helped form SRI's mission. 
Um, Pudov had been thinking of the term psychoenergetics, so I suggested that we spend a few hours erecting a new box and flow organizational chart. Ingo loved charts. He was an artist, and so you'll see his charts in his different books and in the archives. Um, so based on that concept and relate that concept to the multidisciplinary approach. And um, so again, he deserves credit with even forming um, the early SRI programs and much of what happened there. And again, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because for me, what this filled in some blanks. He, he was not just invited to be a research subject, and then all of a sudden he gets invited to have a contract as the trainer for the military. He was very, um, very much part of developing everything they were doing there. And he was also learning from what they were bringing to him as well. So by the time he got to developing controlled remote viewing, controlled remote viewing had aspects of what he learned prior to getting to SRI, but it had aspects of what was learned by other people there, by what Hal and especially Russell Targ doing the outbounder um, experiments of sending people out somewhere, and then they had to tune into that person's location, what that person was perceiving. Those were the outbound experiments that have been written about um, very well in, in Mind Reach and other books by Russell Targ and Hal Pudoff that again, in those days, those came out early um, in SRI's history and is what really um, sparked the media's imagination in all of this. Well, Ingo learned from that approach, but that approach largely came from what Ingo had already been doing, and then it got to be perfected. And even what Skip Atwater was doing within the, working with the military starting in the, um, I think it was around 75 or 76 or so, there was, there was information coming from what he was learning and bringing into the whole dynamics. So this was not just a one di directional flow. It was people working together and there were, and there was a lot of participation from Ingo at every step of the way until he actually did win his contract. Um, I'm gonna skip over these and I just wanna say um, just two more minutes and then we'll hear from John. Um, Project Scanate, this was where Ingo had the idea that if this was gonna be useful, especially within military applications, then you could, not have, you could not be dependent on what they were doing in the outbounder experiments. In the outbounder experiments, you had a researcher, you knew the researcher, you knew when they were gonna go out and then you honed in on them. This was where it was still thought that telepathy was important but the telepathic connection between the remote viewer and the person that was out in the field somewhere. And these were, got, these were um, very successful. And just a side note here, um, my personal belief is they were successful, and this was prior to Ingo introducing um, his methodology, because of a couple of things. One is you had uh, people like Russell Targ, um, sometimes other people, but a, a lot of times Russell, um, sometimes Ingo, um, would be with the viewer every step of the way. They would be monitoring them. They would be interviewing them. So you could have a brand new person who had never done this before show that they could be successful. And this was the case with uh, Hal Hammond. Um, they thought she was gonna be the example of someone who didn't know how to do this kind of thing. and or didn't have these abilities, she was a control subject and she turned out to be very, uh, really fantastic in what she, in her remote viewing. But she was with Russell Targ every single moment. So she didn't have to be guiding herself. She didn't have to know what she was doing. She just had to allow herself to relax. And there is an article coming out in Eight Martinis mag Magazine, it's a transcription of an interview that I and Michelle Bolgatz did a recorded audio interview with Russell Targ, and that should be coming out any day now. And it's the written transcription where we talk about this and where uh, we call it the other side of, of Hammond's brain because we're quite quoting Russell in this. And this is something that has really not been explained that everybody coming into SRI who would do these experiments, they were not put into a 
little room and told to go at it, they were guided step by step by a researcher who was blind to the target. So I'm not suggesting here, um, as skeptics might think that the, you know, that they were somehow um, led uh, or uh, led through the, the interviewer knowing what it was. The interviewer was often blind to the target, but the interviewer told, knew what to tell them to do. Move around the target site, make connection, listen, use all of your senses. This was already um, being seen to be successful and that's what these subjects were being run through. So Ingo in no way um, had a problem with any of that. He found that to be successful with himself. But he said, if this is going to be useful, we have to find a way so we're not dependent on needing to know the outbounder or even having an outbounder. So he said, let's try longitude latitude coordinates. And when he said this, he was completely, this idea was completely dismissed at first. No, that's not possible. This is ridiculous. We already know the telepathic connection is really important. And, but he, because he was stubborn, and this is something as we um, go through our talk here today, we're, going, we're looking at what made Ingo um, gifted. What, what was the gift made of? And part of his gift was he was stubborn and he was also not afraid to step out of the prescribed role for him. He was not afraid to say, okay, even though I'm just a subject here, I'm going to step out of those bounds and tell you what I feel is is reality here and reality is that this is going to work and first he convinced Hal and then he sort of convinced Russell. Russell was not really too thrilled about this but they agreed to let him have a series of trials with him as the viewer. They set up the tar targets and it was successful and this was how coordinate remote viewing um, which eventually then became controlled remote viewing because they realized that some of the viewers were able to recognize as time went on, they became familiar with the coordinates, you know, the north and the west part with it or how the numbers are structured and they really wanted this to be blind. So then they got rid of the, the numbers and, and all of them working together found out you could just have a random target number. Um, Jupiter probe, I just um, have these slides in here from an earlier presentation. We won't get into this except to say that um, this was Ingo's idea. He knew in advance um, that there would be a um, probe going to Jupiter um, that would take pictures in the future. And so he, along with another um, person, I think it was, was it Harold Shermer? I forget Harold's last name, but together they devised this project where they would describe Jupiter. And then they were able to describe, they wanted to describe um, what was not known about it yet. And they did it, they did that. Um, they, they did this within the context of SRI. So researchers collected their data. They then compared it to the images that were generated months later and found this to be successful. And a lot of times people, I didn't realize before I looked at everything in the archives that this was not a completely blind target. So a lot of times, um, and, and blinding, there's different definitions of blinding. So I didn't realize that, and a lot of other people have expressed they didn't, that Ingo did know in advance he was describing Jupiter, but he wanted to show that you can know things about a place, but then there's things you don't know. For example, when he was working at um, um, the American Society for Psychical Research, and they started to do outbounder experiments, some of, sometimes they would go to the uh, museum. Uh, well, I think it was the Natural Science Museum. And I was surprised at first to read that he had this target like um, a number of times and sometimes he knew that's where they were going. And I thought, well, you know, what kind of experiment is that, that he knows where they're going to a museum? But again, there's so much at the museum. So the point was um, not just to, say is this a museum or not but what exhibit is the researcher standing in front of at that time and there was one time where the the outbounders went to the museum and it was closed and they were doing construction and twice they got lost and never made it to an exhibit and Ingo was able to track that in real time 
Um, so what this, even in reading about this, or rereading about this recently, it told me like, oh, well, we could design targets for those who are project managers here. It doesn't always have to be about coming up with a brand new um, location that people don't know about. We can assign to people very specific things that are just not known. And um, this Jupiter is a good example of that. Um, so there's more I want to say about this, but I think this would be a really good time if we heard from John Knowles, um, because John is going to talk about uh, Ingo's research in analytics, and he'll define for you what that is. Um, John is um, the author of Remote Viewing from the Ground Up. He um, was one of the original trainers with um, transdimensional systems um, almost a couple decades ago. He has been a remote viewer and um, speaker and researcher and project manager for a number of years. And um, John can tell you a little bit more about his background as well. And now, Marty, if you can just let me know what I can okay. do to give. Yeah, control. on your screen, there's something that says stop share. It should probably be maybe on the bottom. You know, something having to do with Zoom, it'll stay stop share. I don't know if I can okay, stop I your see sharing. It. I see it. Okay, there you go. And now, John, on your screen, you can go to the bottom and share your computer. I'm clicking share, but. And yes, just wait a, a moment. Okay. And then you'll have some choices and choose your main screen that you want your oh, that's PowerPoint right. that's presentation. Right. Okay, yeah. there we go, okay. There you go, analytics, Ingo Swan experiments with letters, numbers, and symbols. So right. that's what we're seeing. Why don't you make it full screen now? Yeah. There we go. You're okay, safe. can you hear me? I can hear you fine, we okay, all can. Thank you, Deborah. That was yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Really Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> a wonderful picture of uh, what it's like to be in the archives and many years after that, too. So thanks very much and for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about analytics, um, Ingo Swan's experiments with letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, as Deborah mentioned, he typed a lot of his letters. He knew that they'd be in an archive one time, so he actually kept copies of uh, letters that were sent to him, plus his copies of the letters he sent to other people. So here we have his copy, I guess, of the letter to Ed May. He sent a number of reports to Ed May at SRI in the form of uh, correspondence, really. They're not formal reports, which, which is what I'm going to be reporting on here. This is 1988. So he said, what is analytics in the middle there? Recognition through psychic means of abstract symbols, such as numbers, letters, and the state or quality of functioning of objects, machinery, and equipment. And he said that it's recognized in remote viewing that it's very difficult to get numbers, letters, and so forth. And this period in the 1980s to 80, 84 to 86, which I'm going to report on, is after he had been developing CRV for a while. So he's already aware of, of some of those issues uh, and that you could describe things, low-level descriptors, but it's difficult to get these uh, alphanumerics, as he called them. Called them. So here's a few examples from the many, many pages of experiments that uh, Deborah referred to on different topics that he was exploring, sometimes by himself, sometimes with Hal Pudoff, and sometimes with a woman named Gina on the West Coast. So here he was just tabulating when he could get red or black. That was a binary choice. <clears throat> is the card going to be red or is it going to be black? And he would chart these, as we'll see. Uh, here's how he described the experiment. You can read through it yourself. I'll just highlight some of the important things. He says, this is not a forced choice approach. Uh, that term forced choice comes up in the research a lot historically. Uh, I won't get into it here, but there's different uh, opinions about what constitutes a forced choice. Um, but the important thing I wanted to point out was he says, each run was therefore only pursued until a feeling of success or new knowledge was gained. Uh, nothing less than 100% would be suitable as a demonstration that learning had taken place, and I achieved that in this instance in only seven training sessions. So that idea that there's a learning curve 
and you teach yourself your own mental processes. That's what he was focusing on. What are the mental processes I go through as I go through, as I make all these experiments? So he would make comments too about the uh, what he felt, what he thought, what his subconscious was producing as he did these experiments. Here's one about angles and curves. That was it. Just a binary choice. This is at 1984. Here's one where he had to choose between A, uh, looks like a one or O or zero. In other words, a, a triple choice. Which of those three was the correct choice? And he tabulated these as we'll see in a second. Here's another different one. And again, there's dozens of sheets of each of these in the archives where he's trying to get uh, five digits correct. Also notice he, lets, he says he lost contact down at the bottom there. Uh, I lost contact, and he will talk about that in a minute too. What he means by that. So here's something I'd never seen before, and I don't know if anybody's ever done this. He's was experimenting with concepts like hipness, and down at the bottom you can see in red hip, hip bones, swaying hips. That, I think that says cow's hips. That is the target, which he didn't know, I guess, at the time. He, he chose them. Uh, I don't know where he got these. Actually, he doesn't explain a lot of the uh, specific experiments that he does. Um, but you can see this is his response. Most of these actually are not very on target, one might say. Here's a, a weird one, ditness. What's a dit? Well, sending dits and dots in Morse code. So he was going to test that. He also tested Venus, the letter V, maleness, jarness, and penis, both P-E-A and uh, like the, a, a green P. And also the other kind of P, P E E. Um, so here again, he explains what he's doing. He said he neared 100% in sequence seven with only four passes. He did pass at times. And importantly, I anticipate the aptitude should stabilize, allowing for all calls to be correct with no passes. But whether this aptitude will remain stable remains to be seen. And here's one of his charts. There are other charts that don't show 100% success. Here he has 20 trials. They're all successful except for a few passes. So he felt that was extraordinary, which it was, of course. So again, looking more closely at the mental processes that he observed um, toward the bottom there, it says, this clearly indicates that subjective processes other than immediate shape recognition need to be activated, and then to collaborate with the sum of the cascade of the remote viewing information in trying to remote view analytics. And both of these about shape recognition, um, an earlier experimenter named Carrington, who did some of the most uh, extensive early drawings, also said that he felt that it wasn't shape recognition, but the idea of something that was being conveyed psychically and uh, Rene or Collier, I think, has a different take on that. So there's different ideas about the extent to which shape recognition versus um, concept recognition is involved with some of these experiments. So as Deborah mentioned, Swan was aware that uh, psychic awareness is not just the head, it's some kind of whole body field awareness. And he felt this was a breakthrough when he wrote to uh, Ed May about this. Subtle signs are carried to the discriminating brain. There they are factored into possibilities and they can be overlaid by automatically produced brain images. And that reminds us of analytical overlay, which he invented and used uh, in the CRV training. So these latter are what recipients normally offer up as target identifications, usually wrong. So focus on the body instead of the brain leads to positive statistical increase in correct target calls. So this body, brain, mind, or biomind has to be unified. He also says, so is the level and scope of success in psychic viewing somehow dependent upon how the percipient understands how the psychic information is being obtained? He says, yes. And that calls to mind his training in CRV where the trainees are listen to lectures and they take notes and then they write essays about what it is that they're doing. Um, which, as I say, he wrote most of these after the CRV training had been begun. So he'd already come to these conclusions. If you use a blank screen in the mind, then the psychic gets whatever information appears on that screen. The same with a crystal ball. 
but these methods reflect more noise than signal lines since the additional actual holistic elements have not been brought into conscious actualization and are thus operating randomly producing noise. These are just a few of the statistics um, where he will get more calls than Chance would call for, 421, whereas Chance would be 359 and so forth. And sometimes he would fail and he'd be devastated, but well, how come I'm failing? What's going on here? Um, he would point to some of the factors he felt were involved in affecting Psi. One was uh, that it's a high-speed information process and there are internal and external factors. Won't go into those here. He refers to the work of Candace Pert on molecules, signal molecules, he, he called them, and he has more writings about electrical signals, but I'll focus on just two more. One's the analytical summation pool, which he hypothesized. He says the, this sump identifies incoming ESP information signals to give it mental image forms. The sump then uses the stored images or constructs or constructs mixed images out of what is at hand. <laughs> This energy is stronger than the energy from the ESP information flow. So this is a separate kind of mental structure that he hypothesizes exists in these reports, you know, these reports to Ed May and SRI about what he's being paid to research, which he does extensively. You know, he's one of the hardest workers ever. Uh, that's widely acknowledged. So the, the sump will create images of both if it is a forced choice between two targets known to the recipient. That should ring a bell with those of us who've done lots of ARV experiments and subject of displacement. So the correctly identified signal is instantly swept into another pool, leaving behind the vibrant, higher energy, incorrect, incorrect image blazing away in the sump. I think of a fireplace or something, it's quite, a, quite an image. Um, the recipient's attention tends to focus on it. He assumes that's the psychic signal, and we get psi missing, the bane and blight of parapsychology. So he says the recipient has to train himself away from the strong automatic focusing that locks him into the sump. And when this can be accomplished and it's not easy, a surprising thing occurs, the sump vanishes altogether and the center of the high speed perceptual process seems to reappear at the target itself. And he talks about that in the next slide or two. At least that is the feeling about it. I refer to this as a contact when it happens and the target can be called correctly as long as this contact lasts. He also hypothesizes that there are two energy polarities, a field one or two, or a universe one and two, and it's field one surrounds the body, field two was seen to extend to and incorporate the target's location. And that, in this case, was across the country to, San, to uh, the Bay Area or uh, Southern California. Within these fields, demarcations exist between present and future. They, don't, they either do not exist or were considerably weakened allowing for sighting future targets more or less in their correct order. And one other main topic here, lumps. So these uh, lumps and sumps are not present, written about as far as I can recall in his published works, except maybe in, uh, there may be one, but in general, it's not well known about these lumps and, and sumps. So he noticed the lumps of targets began coming in altogether a lump contains three or four targets, the present time target being only one among them. Then a lump of 10 targets occurred, which eight were correct. This happened again. So he turned his attention to the lumps. When he did so, the effect was system collapse. The conscious mind messed it up. The brain likes one for one perceptual tasks, but lumps would sort of back up within the analytical channels and sit there waiting to be perceived and called. So Gina was a woman uh, on the West Coast and she would put an object in front of her and then Swan would try to guess what it was. And he found that after she cleared other objects around, so it was just, that object was just sitting there by itself, he did much better. 12 out of 18 correct as opposed to 5 out of 19. So he experienced a shift in focus, those fields he was talking about, and felt he was at Gina's room. It was an out-of-body type experience. And he claimed it was a breakthrough when he recognized that he could tell if a candle was lit or unlit. In other words, not only the object, but its condition. 
He then went on to do work on words um, and had an interest in accuracy over time, although that too is not well known that he was able to do some experiments with words, moved on to sentences, and then he was going to move on to words to find an operational remote viewing. Stats began to improve over the latter half of 1987. The brain may be a broadcaster functioning more by field effects than by hard wiring. And he talks about resonance, which is a theme that Simeon Heim, another longtime researcher, remote viewer, has explored. In fact, has a book called Resonance Remote Viewing, I believe. Most, if not all, noise originates in the unfocused biomind group, while the resonant fields encountered are almost pure signal. So toward the end of this correspondence, he says he really needs to get access to some EEG equipment and refers to Benjamin Libet, Libet's work. Um, and he also wanted to go out to uh, Elmer Green, I guess, in the Midwest, who had some experiments. And I spent a week out there, but I don't know the results of that. So he agrees with Libet that uh, conscious intention does not initiate action, but only inhibits or permits the movement initiated by a pre-conscious process unique or peculiar to that, to each individual. And this is the last slide. In each field, time and space do not seem to exist in the same time lineup as we experience them in our normal objective time space continuum. A psychic loop gets going. So this puts our problem directly alongside some familiar quantum models. And he explores that a little bit. And of course, we've seen a lot of uh, speculation and theorizing about that um, in present day remote viewing. So I'll stop there, uh, some additional ideas about Ingo's extensive experiments and the mind uh, features that he tried to present, which is some of the best material you'll find on that anywhere in, in the remote viewing literature. So thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, John. Sure. And then if you can give me back the screen yeah. share. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so just a couple of things building on that. Here is, it. can you guys see my screen? Oops. Can you guys, are you guys seeing my screen right now? Anybody? Yes, we're seeing Ingo, okay. you were seeing your first slide. Okay. And there might be a little delay. I have a chart up right now. Okay, it looks like my um, internet is unstable. If you can just let me know if you can hear me. Okay, we're hearing you now. We're still, okay. yeah, there, okay. Did why study, why study Ingo? We're not seeing a graph. I think you went to a, there's the graph. We've got it now. Okay. We just have a little delay here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is just a visual depiction depiction of some of his analytic work. And you can see um, this is this is showing the progress. Graph demonstrates a typical fluctuating curve expected inside analytic median theory. So basically the how the analytical mind works. So the subject becomes aware of psi analytic conflict. That would be where your brain is trying to insert what it thinks the target is. Um, subject recedes towards psi analytic median, awareness of reversals taking place, and then conscious control begins to manifest. Less spontaneous runs heighten perceptions of being able to control psi factor in present time, and then subject gains cumulative control. So, this was something he put together, and then he sent this to Gertrude Smidler to show that, that they were making progress at SRI. Uh, the, the one other thing I wanted to build on with what John was saying with the concept of lumps is there's a few documents within the archives where, where he, actually I think it was a letter to Ed May, because at this point this was in the early 80s when Med, Ed May had taken over as director. And so what uh, much of what John was just sharing, this was um, when Ed May was the director, but Ingo was really uh, spearheading a lot of that research. He had other researchers that, that were 
working with him and then he would just send a, a report to Ed. But in one letter, he's really excited. And this is where he became aware of, I believe what um, John is referring to as the lumps. And so in this experience, he describes that suddenly he became aware of 10 targets or close to 10 all at once in his mind. And it was, they all came pouring in. So this was, cause he was doing trial after trial. And so he saw all of them and he was somehow able to rearrange. This was really, again, a, like a transcendental experience. It wasn't something that he really knew what he was doing, but all of a sudden he knew he was seeing the ones lined up in the future and he was able to somehow get the arrangement of it that then produced the correct results for the next several ones. And that was really what gave him the realization of lumps and how that we become aware of not just the target we're being given to, but the tar but the future ones that we're going to see, which, you know, as those of you who do uh, ARV are aware that we can have issues with displacement, seeing the wrong um, target in the wrong order. So this is speaking to that. Um, I wouldn't say that that he came up with exactly, you know, how to work with that, but it was definitely a, something he was really excited about. Now, with that, I would like to introduce. We're going to um, move here to talking about Scientology, which is a topic that we all find very fascinating. And so I would like to introduce our next speaker. I'm, we're, um, I'll turn off my video um, when he gets going, but I'll just keep up my presentation. I have his slides here. And so okay. I'd like to introduce Russell Pickering. And he, Russell, left Scientology. So he was um, an early Scientologist at about the same time as Ingo in 1983. He is trained with many of the ex-Scientologists and peers of Ingo's era outside the organization since 1996. Many of them deceased or well until their, into their 70s or 80s now. Russell became interested in remote viewing after discovering the CRV manual online in 2010. He initially trained in TRV with Ed Dames, and he's now an intermediate graduate student of Paul Smith's CRB courses, and he's going to be taking Paul's class, advanced training in a couple weeks. And since 2010, he has been an obsessive student of all things Ingo. Recently, he has assisted with understanding the Scientology aspect of Ingo's archives. And I also know that Russell helps people with their own self and personal development. And I was very interested in that as well. So we're very, very fortunate to have him talking about the subject today. Okay, take it away, Russell. Okay, hello everybody. Um, first and foremost, Marty, thanks for hosting. Deborah, thank you so much for um, the access you've given me and inviting me to do this. And the biggest thing I would really like to put out there is the graciousness of the family for making this available uh, to us. If this information and these histories and documents had been lost, it would have been absolutely tragic. So I'm really super grateful. Um, the talk that I had prepared, I'm going to shift just a tiny bit because of a couple of things uh, that uh, Deborah and John have brought up. Uh, the intent here is to barely, barely break the ice on this topic of Scientology. The biggest um, problem that's existed with that is in the remote viewing community. There's been some ignoring of it, some denying of it, and in certain aspects, you would have to say almost a revisionist history. Uh, my opinion is those days are over now. Ingo uh, left us archives, which substantiate um, things very clearly. He's also been in some interviews uh, that he substantiated things very clearly. And then he wrote some bit about it in his own online autobiography, Remote Viewing, The Real Story. For us now, I think it becomes a matter of integrity um, for us to acknowledge what is historical fact. Um, nobody wants to be associated with something that has the unpleasant reputation that the organization does today, but we do have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, as an example with Ingo, you know, it was 52 or well, actually 58 years ago when he got his first interest. So, I mean, it's almost six decades. Things obviously change over time. 
the clearest facts that I can state that are now absolutely verified and can be proven strictly by Ingo's own words are this. Um, Ingo uh, got his first interest in Scientology in 1961. Um, and entered Scientology in April of 1967, and was there until approximately 1982, uh, where his last course registry is published. And I say approximately, because I don't know if the course registry is published six months later than he took the course or whatever. Um, he became clear, of the state of clear in 1969, and technically he was clear number 2,231. From there, with full immersion into uh, Scientology, he had attained uh, OT7. OT is a term Hubbard used for operating Thetan. Thetan is a derivative of the word Theta that he considered representative of spirit. So a Thetan was basically a unit of spirit, if you will. Um, the other thing that Ingo did was he was a, what's called a class six auditor. The significance of that is much more significant than the uh, alleged secret levels in Scientology in that he spent thousands of hours with the biofeedback device, which is a galvanic skin response, both um, doing his own solo sessions, introspection, and then looking at the meter for energetic responses with his, within his own mental space. Uh, there's a document out there, I won't go through quoting or anything right now, where Ed May noted that uh, Ingo had a very high and substantial awareness of his own inner processes. And myself having used the meter for a few thousand hours, it really becomes like a Pavlovian type training where you feel a sensation inside and then you see it on the meter then you look at the result of the sensation, and at some point you start to get a sense of navigating um, your own inner world. The other aspect to the auditor is that he listened to God knows how many people's uh, subjective exploration of themselves. That could be everything from telepathic uh, connections, uh, maybe unwanted connections with entities, uh, prior biographies, so he listened and listened and listened, and he guided those people through their session based on his own inner navigation. So, so the fact that he was a classics auditor comes to um, a question or, or a statement that uh, Dever made about Ingo just making up CRV. If somebody fully, completely understands the Scientology experience and how, uh, not all, but certain elements of it were evolved out of Scientology, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even remotely question it. One of those is this position of auditor. Auditor just simply means listener and effectively guide. So when Ingo incorporated monitors into remote viewing, the way the paperwork's done, the process, the um, overall tone of, of a monitor moving someone to inspect, not their own inner world, but uh, remotely, you know, a distant uh, location in time or space, uh, you'll see the direct correspondence to monitor and auditor. Um, one of the key factors in this is when an individual was exploring their own mental space, let's say uh, some sort of mental image uh, that they associate as a prior biography, you had to use stage twos as an auditor um, for your person. So right here in the original uh, first edition of the Scientology Dictionary, which Ingo would have effectively had memorized, it says very clearly, um, theta or spiritual perception, that which one perceives by radiating towards an object and from the reflection, perceiving various characteristics as the object such as size, or what we call dimensionals, odor, tactile, sound, color, etc. So literally the stage twos, um, he used, you know, probably hundreds of times before he ever incorporated them uh, into CRV. 
I'll give a quote here of uh, Ingo. So <clears throat> uh, this is from Advanced Magazine, which was a Scientology publication. It can be found online. There's also a copy in the archives. This was a 1978 interview with Ingo. And they said, how did you first get into psychic research? Ingo responded, I guess I've always been interested in the miraculous nature of man. I read the most turgid, thick, and endless books about the so-called higher abilities of mankind. It all seemed very beautiful and unfruitful. Then came Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard's astonishing thoughts on man as a spirit, the living, existing spirit, creative possible aptitudes of spirit trying to conquer matter, energy, space, and time. The conquest was only possible after the spirit got rid of and I won't try to decipher the Scientology lingo, basically um, their own personal mental filters and the dreadful beliefs, which is also a paraphrase, by which the individual cuts himself down to nothing. Well, after years of auditing and studying in Scientology, I finally arrived at a place where I could level out someone. I got interested in something to do in society, and for some reason, which escapes me now, I thought it would be a good idea to go and volunteer as a subject in parapsychology. And thereby lies the long tail. And at this time, that was almost eight years ago. So um, without going into too much more, because I know we're trying to respect time here, um, the concept of remote viewing was very familiar to Ingo prior to ever going to uh, SRI. And that can be seen here where the Scientology term uh, for it was called remote lookingness. Again, this is from the uh, you know, official technical dictionary, which is a publication um, referring clear back to the 1950s. So what he called a viewpoint, which he elaborates beautifully in his online autobiography, where there's a chapter called, uh, how do you see basically without physical eyes. And he talks about how to create this remote viewpoint, how to interact uh, based on what uh, Deborah pointed out in terms of interest and curiosity, how to interact with it, and then bring information back and describe it. So the brief definition is a point of awareness from which one can perceive. That thing which an individual puts out remotely to look through a system of remote lookingness. Here we just call it a remote viewpoint. It's a specialized kind of viewpoint. And it goes on to explain effectively what ended up being described as by location. Ingo having his presence here as remote viewers are instructed to do to keep the form and then some aspect of yourself um, interacting with the information that you intend to act with. So remote lookingness and remote viewing, um, the uh, monitor auditor, another aspect of uh, CRB, which is um, completely straight out of Scientology is the clay modeling. Ingo would have had to done hundreds of hours of tests to demonstrate his concepts. And that's where he found out about the kinesthetic, kinesthetic ability to have that concept come through your hands and bring form and shape. So myself, I've been through, um, you know, like 40 some hours of testing using clay. So that uh, is something that he uh, brought over as well. Um, let me take a look at the notes here since I updated what I was going to say. Um, okay, the Jupiter uh, probe uh, and things like this, the exploration of the planets, Moon and Mars that Ingo had done, um, he was trained in that thoroughly before uh, starting uh, remote viewing. In 1954, there was uh, drills published by Scientology that Ingo would have practiced many, many times. It was called the, it's from this book, uh, The Creation of Human Ability. So clear back in 1954, they were doing this. So the commands were be near Earth be near the moon, be near the sun, back and forth. And each time the auditor must wait until the pre-clear, meaning the, the session partner or the viewer, signifies that he has complied with the command. 
The preclear is supposed to move near these bodies or simply be, be near them. It does not matter which. Then we'll go on to explain what they discovered about uh, the surface of Mars, uh, some sort of an interference shield there. So again, he had done drill after drill after drill in his OT processes on how to explore the solar system. The reason that um, a lot of people appear to not want to know about this connection and how Ingo brought things over um, is, is very understandable. Anybody, you know, I, I don't know anybody that would like remote viewing negatively associated with anything, but history is history, truth is truth. The last uh, point that I'll make here and then uh, ease out of this is I, I wasn't familiar with the documents that John just showed, but where Ingo talked about the three universes uh, in that brief description there, that was um, straight from the, the uh, practices here, again in the dictionary, the three universes. The universes then are three in number. The universe is created by one viewpoint, the universe created by every other universe or every other viewpoint, and then the universe created by the mutual actions of the viewpoints. And it goes on to explain a little more, which, you know, if we have more time, I can show how what John posted interacts with that. The basic point here being, um, Scientology had a strong interface and a strong impact. There were other Scientologists, some yet as undisclosed. They've never come out and publicly said who, who they were, that they were Scientologists. One recently did, which actually surprised me, but I won't mention their name here. So the point is, there was a lot of people at SRI and in the early stages uh, of CRV, or remote viewing development and eventually CRV, that had been extremely active for decades in Scientology. Now, the final thing is, does remote viewing owe Scientology anything? The answer to that is no. No more than Scientology owes uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, and all of the other, the, the budding scientists of quantum physics were involved in it. Um, this is all stuff that belongs to everybody. Ingo's drive, and this, this is where I want to end with, is that when you read the, the lengthy discourses, uh, there's an example of how warm the relationship between he and uh, L. Ron Hubbard was. They always signed their letters, love, they were very personal, they were very um, passionate and dedicated. But when you read Ingo's side of the letters, he had an immense love for humanity. He wanted nothing more than all of us to find out what our true nature is and be able to express it. <clears throat> In all of his letters, he just strove for us all to be free. That's what drove him um, through all of the obstacles and everything he went through. And you can see here, you know, the letter with Hubbard on the screen, that's even addressed to Stanford Research Institute building such and such. Um, there wasn't a big covert spy operation or any of this. Hubbard had hopes that Ingo and the other Scientologists could scientifically verify the processes they had been using, solidify them, and then bring them to broader humanity, even outside of the church. So if you look at, uh, uh, Hubbard's words to Ingo here, um, very well done, Ingo, on your progress and the very best for many more great wins as you proceed in your plans. Don't hesitate to call if you need help. You are certainly making huge strides into what is, for man, a new and amazing field, and we appreciate and congratulate you. And that, with that, I'll wrap up uh, due to the time constraints. The summary is this, there's just a factual relationship. It wasn't um, half of the conspiracies and nonsense that people talk about. By the family putting this out there, we can alleviate a lot of that, shed some light on it, and hopefully find ourselves being able to naturally talk about the factual history 
of how this all came together and then find out what our future is and, and go there together. So that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Russell um, and Deborah and John. Thank you, Deborah, really for you know organizing um, everything here. And I think we'll open it up for questions uh, unless Deborah, you have some final remarks. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm not sure, um, and I'm sure, uh, well, I wanna say thank you to Russell there. There were um, things there that um, if uh, I hadn't even realized about the clay, the work with the clay and um, the, the influence of the monitoring and interviewing. And that really, uh, I would say it would have been uh, if I had realized that, I would have put that even before in, in historical order before he got to the ASPR, since it's clear that by the time he got to the ASPR, which we were really looking at is the start of his experimental work um, with research institutes, that he already had all of that, um, uh, that experience within Scientology. So even those early experiments where he was showing he he had some great successes and then sometimes a decline effect were impacted by by that and I think that's really important and I I also do think that it's really a shame that um, because of the negative thoughts about Scientology that it's really masked the the value that came out of that for people as any time a stereotyping of a group of people, including mediums, psychics, you know, there, there's so much information that we, we don't even hear from the people that do this work because of the stereotypes uh, against them. And, and this is a, a very strong example. Um, Marty, I do, um, we have Coral who um, did a videotape of just making some comments about the research she did over the week. Um, her video was three minutes and then had some closing comments, but I'll leave it up to, to you. No, no, um, go ahead. Go ahead. This is all fascinating. I guess I just want to emphasize the thing about Scientology. When he was doing it, Ingo and many others, um, in the very early days, you know, 1967 to 82, apparently, um, it was a different organization. It's my understanding that he left because he noticed the changes. And now we hear all these terrible reports about it, which have been used, you know, to try to harm his early work. And I think that is outrageous. But it's important to understand the Scientology that he was involved in is very different than the Scientology today. Right, Martin. Thanks for mentioning it. Because like I said, I modified what I was going to say to what uh, John and Deborah, but there is no possible way to exaggerate the statement you've just made. It was exponentially different. And I would have gone into that a little more. Um, but yes, thanks for pointing okay. that out. Okay, so now what we, yeah, let's definitely see your video. Go for it. Okay, so this is from Coral. Carte, and she is a longtime remote viewer, and she is originally from South Africa, uh, and now she's living in Italy. She has studied controlled remote viewing with Lynn Buchanan since 2001, and she is also an artist, and she's a professional remote viewer right now, and she's also going to be bringing controlled remote viewing to people in Italy. Um, helping to train them soon as well. And so she, I, I asked her if she could um, help out just with going through some of Ingo's books, which I knew she was already familiar with, but just, just look to see what was relevant to our talk today. And she might be here, but she was gonna be traveling. And so she just recorded a three minute video about her impressions about the subject of Ingo um, okay. being good. And good. so Let's here play the opportunity for being here it's a great honor and it was an equally great honor to have been able to have spent some time rereading Inga's work um, it was a wonderful encounter to find uh, those writings again but to paraphrase what one of Inga's sayings one gets out what one puts in and when 
one approaches certain readings with a more mature mind, one comes away with a much more profound level of information. So a nicer way to put it uh, would be educated mind in illuminating information out. Inga was very, very, very well read. Each new library that he was given access to was a garden of delight for him. Now, after many years of my own studies that don't even meet half of what he read and did, I can meet his work on a different level. For example, when he talks about, um, in his book, uh, Psychic Sexuality, the Cartesian divide between body and soul, I can now relate to that because of the studies that I myself have done to be able to conduct a transformational body work classes with people who come uh, suffering from what co could be called society's illnesses, which actually are caused by the division between the body and the soul that's common in our society. And like Inga, we remote viewers know that it's not true because we know that we learn with our body. Um, I have uh, still a moment of semi-anguish when I prepare blank sheets of paper with coordinates ready to remote view. And each and every time I arrive at set aside, I write F-O-F, -F, yes, that fear of failure. But each time the structure and the studies I've done carries me through and I can produce magic most of the time, but it's taken many, many years of study, practice, meditation to be able to arrive at this point. Now, one of the things that interests me a lot is the link between creativity and intuition. And the more I study and the more I mature, one of the things I've come to realize about creativity is that when one has this gift, it leaves one with a constant thirst or a feeling of need. It's a need of constantly um, having to do something or to produce something. And the, there's two things that, that calm this feeling. And the one is being actually being creative, making things. And the other is learning and studying. And so I wonder if that drive that Inga had didn't have something to do with it because I think that that's what drive me. So thank you for listening to me. Bye. <laughs> so thank you, Carl. And um, now just a few more words and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, there's a lot we could talk about. And can you can you see my PowerPoint now? No, I see a big thumb. Okay. But the video, the video is still on oh. your main screen. Okay. Let me go over here. Um, you know, I'll, I'll um, resume share. There you go. Swan had to advocate for himself. Okay. So this is kind of switching gears and I won't go into this too deeply, but this is speaking again to what made Ingo um, stand out and what were part of his gifts. And in, it's, it's not just about psychic, um, psychic abilities, but it's also what how do those show up? So even just being able to have the focus to do his work, um, he had to make sure that his physical needs were taken care of. And he had to advocate to get paid equally. And so there's a lot of correspondence going back and forth regarding that. And let me just go along here. Um, sometimes he was frustrated at SRI uh, because he felt like he was not being recognized, um, that that his name wasn't appearing in documents because of the same we talked about earlier, he was seen as a research subject rather than as um, someone with equal status of the other researchers. And so he had to send out memos about that. Um, and did did his speaking up for himself, this is, did his being an advocate work? And uh, one of the reasons again, of doing this whole talk is to, that he is serving as an example of what 
those of you who are remote viewers or doing other psychic types of work or even in uh, subjects and research projects also um, may be inspired by. So yes, it did work. And so um, all of his contracts are in the archives and what I did was put together a little chart about his salary increases. Um, it's felt a little awkward because it seems like salaries are supposed to somehow be um, be not uh, widely talked about or exposed, but still it's in there and people might find it interesting. So um, think about back when he worked at the ASPR for $50 a day, which he was quite happy about. He went to $90 a day in 1972 at SRI. Um, by 76, he was at $200 a day. Um, by May, he it was um, from May to October, it went to from 200 to 300, and then in 84 it was $400 a day. That's you know not too shabby for that period of time. Um, I'm just gonna skip over here to at some point when you view his contracts, you see a change. Whereas it always said from the beginning that he was a consultant um, that will provide services in the assessment of current program. Um, he, um, and also serve as a subject, you started to see a change. His um, contract provision from the 80, 80 through 84 was having to do with him sharing a proprietary analyst, analytic technique, controlled remote viewing, which shall remain his. The use of CRV technique in the context of the SRI program, um, now I can't read the rest because my half of my screen is blocked. But basically the contracts show that he was the trainer and that he was the owner of this material. Now, if you study contract law, you'll see that really a system and method cannot be copyrighted, only his written materials. So that's why when the when his training was moved over to the military unit, um, one of the people, Paul, Paul Smith's um, Ingo student, he, um, he, he basically reconstructed um, the methodology onto paper, which became the official um, military controlled remote viewing manual. So he constructed it from his memory, essentially. He had some notes, but Ingo actually kept a lot of his students' notes. Those notes are now in the archives. So you can look at it in two ways. One, he was being super controlling to actually collect his student notes, and in some cases, not give them back. So when I talked to Paul, Paul didn't even have his own notes, and he didn't even have some of his own viewing sessions, which you can say like, oh, well, you know, that's not so cool. On the other hand, it is now all in one place within the archives. And then we're able to you know, share some of that with Paul and his other students who for the last 20 years didn't have access to these. But so his methodology had to be recreated from memory because he actually was the owner of his materials but not of the methods themselves. And I think that that's something to imp important to keep in mind. You know, it's very easy to learn from someone and then as their teacher, you want to respect them and you might feel bad about, you know, when you, it's natural progression to feel like you want to teach what you learned. And then there's always this place that a student reaches is this conflict. You know, how do I go out and express myself and share this with others, but I don't want to become in competition with the teacher or with the trainer and and just I think it's really important that if we're going to, you know, make this really uh, well known to people and that we all have these gifts, then we have to all even as teachers be very open to once our students have learned, you know, enough where we're competent that they can pass the information along in a diligent way that we open up and allow for that because otherwise progress will be stopped. Um, just a couple more notes here, and then I promise we'll finish up in just two minutes. Let's just let's just summarize here. So, in summary, um, um, when Marty asked me to do this talk a week ago, um, I, I and, and to talk about was Ingo gifted or did he just learn all of this? I tried to tune into Ingo, um, his spirit, his consciousness. And I was, I was saying, were you gifted or did you just learn this? And the response I heard was, 
I was a hard worker. So that, if nothing else, there's no doubt about that. He had, um, and he says of himself, he tried to stay in control. He was stubborn. He spoke out. He refused to be bored, meaning if he got bored, he stopped a task and did other tasks. He did a million trials. He, he was honest about his own limitations, and he created a firm intellectual foundation from, from reading and from talking to everybody. That's also very clear in his archives. Hundreds and hundreds of letters with people that are experts in this field that people that were also just just seekers like he was everything came together to make him successful um just a couple more things he was not a typical research subject he refused to just be a research subject he refused to just sit there and keep the information to himself this did not always make him popular this angered a lot of people um, and sometimes justifiably so. He was not always right about what he was insistent about. And he created enemies, and some of these enemies are still out there today trying to um, discredit his work. And um, any final words here? He felt fear made him successful. He mm. said fear was a fa fascination. Um, he said, as a child hiking alone in the, word, in the woods, one day I was determined to get over my fear. And so he made himself go into the woods and, and he was fearful, but he just stayed there. He didn't run away and the fear vanished. And he would use that over and over again because as Coral said in her video, that the fear is there every time you see that blank piece of paper what if I can't do this? Or what if I'm wrong? That especially happens in our associative remote viewing tasks. So what set Ingo apart were his circumstances, his creativity, his experimentation, um, that he received income while practicing so he could devote his time to this and certain personality characteristics. With that, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, excellent. So any of you have questions, you can turn on your mic or put it in the chat box. Are you seeing the chat box, Deborah, or I can read it to you? Um, if you can read it, because I'm a little lost with all Yeah, the okay. Things. Well, we'll see. Um, okay, somebody for Rusha opened up. Go ahead. Hi, um, this is for Rusha. I wanted to... Um, talk a little bit about something that is kind of personal to me with Ingo Swan. And um, that is that, um, like Ingo Swan, um, I was an art major and a visual art major and some years younger than him, I might add. But I lived in his zip code for a number of years. And I wanted to talk for just a minute because I feel like it's a, almost like a catharsis for me. I won't stay on long, I promise. But when I was about 17 years old, I wrote a letter to the American Society for Psychical Research explaining how I was being visited by something uh, in the nights and having all kinds of a psychic emergency because I was a psychic reader even then when I was a kid for people in my neighborhood for like um, uh, housewives who would have me over, et cetera. And the Society for Psychical Research uh, sent me a letter back, the American Society for Psychical Research. They sent me a letter back telling me to visit a psychiatrist, that they didn't, they didn't want anything to do with me. Later on, I was working in Manhattan, living right near Ingo, knew, knowing people that knew him, but never meeting him working at parties where he had worked with the same society people to the extent of which I even had a client for a matter of four years who was a very, very wealthy lady. And uh, she promised to introduce me to Ingo, but never did. In the long run, unfortunately, this woman had a very, very, very tragic life. And I tried to talk to her about it, but wasn't able to get her to make any changes that would have helped her. But between Ingo Swan and John Keel, uh, I've had the weirdest life experience of being one 
uh, you know, one step away from both of them through like dozens of people. And um, I study Ingo and I really appreciate uh, Deborah for doing this program. And thank you also, Marty and the other presenters. I'm sorry, I just- I Okay, Perusa, thank you. I'm glad you shared that. That's good. Uh, Patricia? Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to just speak to that for a minute because it's-, it's really Okay, good. okay, so, go ahead, Deborah. And then yes. Patricia. So, so Ingo, in many of his writings, talks about how prejudiced um, the ASPR and um, and so many parapsychologists um, were against anybody that had um, would call themselves a psychic or had experiences like that you're talking about. They might study mediums, but somebody that was saying they were having visitations or things like that, um, they didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't, um, they distanced themselves. And this has done a lot of damage. And um, Ingo talks about this and um, he, in his early writings, he's very critical of the ASPR. And he said that most of his friends or many of his, his friends in the higher society circles um, very much disliked the ASPR because of this. And this attitude ha of, of trying to distance oneself from people who are having these experiences um, still exists today. It also exists within remote viewing um, circles. I think it's getting a little bit better, but myself, when I first started training in remote viewing, I was already a practicing clairvoyant um, trained. I, I got trained myself when I was 27 years old at the Berkeley Psychic Institute um, and spent a lot of time in different energy healing um, classes and things like that. So when I entered, even in taking classes in controlled remote viewing um, and getting into research, um, I had to really endure a lot of stereotypes, a lot of uh, negative comments um, from my own teachers who I had a lot of respect for and still do, but understanding the way I've looked at it is even though it's it's hurtful and I have to sometimes lick my wounds from it, um, that it really comes from a lack of knowledge and, and fear. And hopefully moving forward, we can bridge those two worlds. Uh, but there's, uh, I'm sorry you had to go through that, definitely. Okay, good. Patricia? Why don't you turn on? Uh, oh, yes, <laughs> I just did. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to all that have been involved in organizing this talk. It's very interesting. And um, I would like to start reading a quote from Mr. Ingo Swan that I find very interesting. He said that our species does possess senses and cognitive faculties the information function of which is to transcend the parameters and limits of the physical and tangible and so to speak plug us into the information which is available all of the time i find this so interesting and very rich on one side he's talking he's telling us that we are built in such a way that we can transcend the physical and the tangible. And in another way, um, he chooses the words plug us into information. I find that very interesting because nowadays scientists are talking about the caudate putamen. Probably I'm not pronouncing it well, so sorry for that. It's a part in your brain that could function like an antenna. And the studies are revealing that those who have more developed psychic abilities show some differences on this part of the brain. And that talks about genetics. And I know that Mr. Ingleswan's mother and grandmother had also psychic abilities. Also, there is something, um, that I would like to comment, talking about nature and nurture. I found somehow very contradictory that some cultures like, some cultures that have had thousands of years 
of indoctrination in yoga, meditation, vegetarianism, CDs, etc., 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 don't necessarily reflect precisely enlightenment in their population. Just two weeks ago, there was a news coming out of India uh, that it says about talk about two kids that were killed by their neighbors because they were found defecating on the street. I mean, this is a news coming out of India where people know about meditation and all that stuff, right? And when talking about Scientologists, you would think that all of the people in that religion, religion will be super psychics, but it's not precisely what you hear. So, and the, this brings me to Terence McKenna. Terence McKenna, when he, when he was asked about meditation as a way to enlightenment or to reach higher states of consciousness, he plainly says no. Because, I mean, it's uh, so... Patricia, do you, have, do you have a question, though? This uh, is yes. interesting. Yes. Okay, good. Go uh, ahead with your uh, question. Well, why, um, what do you think is the relation then of genetics? Talking about nature and nurture. Yes, yes. Well, um, and if any of anyone else wants to chime on, on that, I think that that is something that's um, currently being studied. Dean Radin at the Institute for Noetic Sciences has had a uh, ongoing experiment or, or research into this um, it you know it's very hard to isolate the the variables involved and on and you can definitely you know again it's it, it's uh, who raised you you know is it a matter of genetics or is it a matter that these people were openly talking about these subjects and didn't ridicule or forbid you know their children to to talk about them it's it's challenging so I, I think that you know that the ongoing debate goes on within psychology and it'll probably go on in this, in this arena as well and just one other thing you said that i think is really uh, a lot of what you just said was important but one particularly so is that we have to get over these false expectations that just because a person um even a person who might seem more enlightened you know who has who has certain abilities or even sometimes, you know, has certain awarenesses, um, that doesn't mean that they're going to have moments where they behave badly and where they don't follow what they, they preach. And this was a really hard lesson I had to have because I, um, I left my job as a federal probation officer when I was um, soon after I opened up with my abilities and I went to the Philippines and worked with different healers there. And some of these people were very, I mean, could do just incredible healing feats and they were very spiritual, but at the same time, they would go out and drink. Um, they would visit brothels. They would sometimes lie about things. And, and it's really about any time you put someone on a pedestal, they're, they're eventually going to fall off. So it's, I think much of this problem, just like the nature nurture debate, you know, what this dualistic thinking of it one or the other, that is what is really the problem here. It can be both things or, or neither things or usually it's somewhere in the middle is where the truth lies. And if we can change our thinking and always look at, well, what's valuable in either end of things, that's, you know, there's a reason why there's these debates because there are truths to these different sides. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and you know, and a lot of that, um, and I agree with everything that's been said here, but I think what needs to be noted is genetics and even your early environment sets up a special way you are. Maybe you're already open and have the psychic ability, maybe it's been shunted but the real issue is as ingo did for years if you keep working he seems to imply all of us have much greater psychic abilities than we would normally think we have and how high you can go is the challenge and that's what 
I think people who do remote viewing, who do ARV, are um, working on to learn that about themselves, which is marvelous. There's one question here, though, people have started to answer it. Do you know if Ingo or anybody else, I guess, in our community was involved in Avatar? Mm -hmm. The movie Avatar? Uh, well, in the, in the group, there was an Avatar organization. And group you know the movie. Wait, you know the movie Avatar? Oh. I don't think it's I'm, about the movie. I think no. it's about Harry Palmer's journal. Uh, avatar and there is car. I entered this privately. Uh, there was correspondence. There is correspondence be about Harry Palmer in the archives. It's primarily from people, if I recall correctly, who were critical of what uh, Harry Palmer had done. And Ingo kept the correspondence. There isn't too much where Ingo puts forward his own views, as I as I recall. Maybe Deborah's read some more, or maybe Russell knows. But that's my take on it. Okay, wait. Please clarify that for me. You said something at the beginning. I didn't get. You're saying Avatar was like what? A, a it's a book? group, and I think it had a, a publication that Harry Palmer was involved with, and I think Ingo was ah, part of that. that. Okay. Nothing, nothing to do with the movie. The movie. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Just um, real quick, uh, Marty. Avatar was a direct derivative. Um, of Scientology, Harry Palmer left uh, when Ingo, uh, I'm sorry, when Elrond Hubbard dropped off the scene. Uh, many year, people- What year was that? What year was that? The, the last correspondence between Ingo and Elrond was 1979. No, but when time, did Hubbard, did Hubbard leave around then? Well, in 1982, when this new group took the church uh, over. Okay. Okay, so a lot of people defected, me, Ingo, and hundreds of others. Um, but the other thing that's interesting to note, most people don't realize the Scientology derivatives we have in our society today. Um, Werner Earhart, for instance, came out of Scientology. He started uh, originally Est, which then became, um, oh, I can't remember the name, the way he changed the group. There was a couple of gurus that reached the highest levels of Scientology, left the group, and started their own ashrams. Um, and now, today, shockingly, um, the galvanic skin response meter has prolific use in uh, uh, standard counseling practices throughout. So anyways, back to Avatar. It was a Scientologist that left and started his own version of it. But up until Hubbard was there, I guess I'm trying to understand this timeline, okay. when Scientology sort of turned, and I think you know, we yeah. all know what I mean by that, was that when Hubbard died? No, Hubbard died in 86, um, but he was sequestered. Whenever, when this group, Religious Technology Center, took over, nobody knew who they were. The internal Scientologist, Alan Hubbard's right-hand man for 16 years, one of the only people he let pilot his ships, he defected. Some of the people that trained me defected. The old good people like Ingo, who had the spirit of let's help this planet, they all left. The ones that didn't leave were purged, and many of them. So Scientology, to me, the way I analogize it, was like a hand grenade. It blew up in a mess, but so much of the shrapnel went out and, and were like seeds. Starting. Okay, but I didn't realize it happened when the new people took over. So yeah, that's good. That clarify. Hubbard was pretty, pretty. He didn't. He wasn't involved in the turn, and that's good to know because. His name is off, obviously associated with Scientology in yeah, general, but he, but he was the early years. Yeah, and Hubbard himself, he, he kind of went off his own track, actually. But yeah, bottom line, 82, okay. they took over. 86, Hubbard died. And from 82 okay. to 86, he was sequestered and died classically without an autopsy, et cetera. Okay, thank you. That, that both, all of this is very illuminating um, in, in oh. many ways. Who else has a question, please? I, I was just going to say, too, um, another group that came out or was founded by a Scientologist was the Landmark Forum, um, mm -hmm. of which I've known several people who found that to be a very useful uh, group. That's, that's a name I was trying to remember. Werner Earhart came out of Scientology, um, started Earhart seminars training, and then because of attacks on him from Scientology, he handed off to his kids and then his kids changed it to Landmark. Yeah. Interesting. I will share with all of you, I am an EST graduate 
And that is where I did my first remote viewing session. And it was remarkable. It blew the person I was working with away. So wow. I'm sharing that. So that was asked. And okay. they did some very good stuff. And they did remote viewing. They basically got you tired. And they asked you to do, essentially, it wasn't called remote viewing. But that's what it was. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm sure I guess the test came up. I go back a long way <laughs> right, right. with best anyway. Um, how about um, other questions or comments? It's quarter to three questions, comments. Put it in the chat box or open up your thing. Okay, Deborah, John, Russell, um, thank you all. This was just really so excellent. And obviously we can come back to different pieces of this. There's just so much to him and what he did. So I thank you all very much um, for putting this together. And with that, I will end this. And all of you have great days. And again, Deborah being the lead, thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye, everyone.